Lord, uh, again, we thank you that we, we come together as a body uh, made up of all different parts, all different um, functions and capabilities, Lord. And I pray that you would help us to, to bind together as one body in you. Uh, this, is, this is where we find our centre, Lord. It is in you that we find our centre. We don't find it in any other denominational flavour. We don't find it in a tradition. We don't find it in a particular way of doing things. We find our faith in you. And Lord, may our hearts and our minds be focused on who you are. That is the Christian faith. Um, if we want to follow other faiths, we can do that. But the Christian faith is focused on you. And so, Lord, as we bring, as I bring this message this morning, I pray that you would, as always, Lord, help us to receive the seed of your word. And as always, any error is mine. All glory and all honour is yours. Amen. So, we are still in Colossians. You would, oh, don't hang your head so low. You, you, you've headbutt the floor. We managed to deal uh, last week, didn't we, when, when we were looking at it with the Christian household um, and we were looking at the, the best way for wives and husbands and children to live together and to love together. And the whole emphasis from Paul uh, is being different to the world and demonstrating a different way of living and being. The wife, if you were to remember, was to submit Da, da, da. We had a big discussion around what submit means. Greek word is hupotasso. And this is the same way that Jesus yielded to his parents. Uh, we looked at that in Luke 2 verse 51. Husband holds a different position, a different role, not because the wife was inferior in any way. It's the role and the position that was being yielded to. And there is no inferiority here. There is complete equality that has been surrendered willingly in order to support, uphold and help carry a burden. That's what it means for a wife to submit. It's a magnificent gesture of love. That's what it is. In likewise, the husband was to love his wife. Greek word was um, agapeo, agape, the love of choice. The love that means doing what's best for them. The love that will sacrifice all self-interests for them. The love that will be completely unselfish towards them. This is what the fellas are called to do. The love that is all give rather than the filio love which is give and take. Or the eros love which is all take. And it's that same self-sacrificing love that God in Christ has for us. A love that was willing to give all, to invest all, to expend all, even if there was no return on the investment. Husbands, that's how you should love your wife. Whether the wife chooses to play her part is immaterial to how the husband behaves. He is called to love her unconditionally with the prospect that there could be nothing coming back. Exactly as God in Christ loves humanity. And the children were called to obey their parents, which is taken from that Greek word hupakui, uh, meaning to listen. Before you can obey, you first have to hear. And that's where it derives itself from, to listen. Obedience isn't just about doing something when instructed. It starts with a willingness to actually listen to what somebody is saying before you can even step into a point of obedience. A readiness to listen to parents then, engage the thinking before commencing the action. And then we read that fathers or parents were advised against a habitually negative way of treating their children. They were encouraged um, not to allow a pattern forming habit that is one of continual pro uh, provo provocation to, to actually build into a life. They were not to be overbearing. Parents were not to be overbearing. They were not to have a constant downer on the child. And they were not to be overzealous in discipline, balance, moderation in all things. The result then would be Christian households where wives would submit to the husbands. Husbands would love their wives. Children would listen to their parents. And parents would not be down on the children demonstrating something completely different to what was going on in the world outside of this culture that we're talking about. This was a radical difference to the way that things were being done at that time. 
So that model and that behaviour um, um, and that pattern of behaviour within the home, if lived out and centred on the person of Christ, will shine in a society. It will shine in a society that's lost its direction and it will offer hope to all who see it and all who follow it. And that pattern is not a bad pattern when you look at society today. It will shine. It will be a different. And so then having established that familial uh, relationship, what Paul does is he moves away from husbands, wives, children, parents, and he starts to look at other household folk. So we're going to have a look at these next few verses of this chapter. I'm going to dip in, and we're also going to dip into chapter 4 as well. Because if you look at the way that it's, these verses are broken up, that chapter 4 is, is broken in, in a really bad place. It, it's, it shouldn't be broken there. Um, chapter and verses are not inspired, by the way. They came in in around about 1560s. We first up with the Geneva Bible. It's not, they're not inspired. So don't panic about that if any of you were which I'm sure you weren't, because you're all much more studious than that and understand that. So we're going to read from Colossians chapter 3. I'm going to read through uh, from verse 22 to chapter 4, verse 1, because that sort of closes that little section off. So Colossians 3, verse 22, through until chapter 4, verse 1, and it will be the New Living Translation. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything you do. Try to please them all the time, not just when they're watching you. Serve them sincerely because of your reverent fear of the Lord. Work willingly with whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward and that the master you are serving is Christ. But if you do what is wrong, you will be paid back for the wrong that you have done, for God has no favourites. Masters, be just and fair to your slaves. Remember that you also have a master in heaven. So we'll kick off with verse 22. We'll see how we go. Slaves, obey your masters. So straight away, at the very start of that little verse, we have a little word that commences slaves. Now, for some people, uh, when they read this, they will then seek to use a verse like this as a reason for why the Bible is wrong. It's no longer relevant in today's culture at all. And anyone who follows the teaching within scripture is clearly an advocate of slavery. Right. Normally, when that is made, it's more often made more often than not in the context of the Afro-American um, slave context. This isn't saying anything about the African-American slave context, nor is this saying anything about the modern day slavery. But modern day slavery is really quite interesting. I I want you to understand this because we bang on about stuff that was done hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And perhaps what we should do is focus on what's happening today now. So just to give you an idea of how prevalent slavery still is in the world. In 2022, in Walk Free, which is the International Labour Organisation and the International Organisation for Migration, they provided the latest global estimates of modern slavery. 49.6 million people are estimated to be living in modern slavery. That's either in forced labour, forced marriage, that sort of thing. And roughly a quarter of all of those are kids, children. So, if you're led to believe that slavery is the domain of Western European countries as well, then you need to think again. Information provided by the OCHA, which is the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, says that the highest rate of slavery in the world is actually found in North Korea. North Korea. And then it's followed by these countries, Eritrea, Burundi, Central African Republic, Afghanistan, uh, Mauritania, South Sudan, Pakistan, Cambodia, Iran. There you go. Modern day slavery. India is home to the largest number of slaves globally with 8 million. Followed by China, Pakistan, North Korea, Nigeria, Iran, Indonesia, Democratic Republic of the Congo, Russia, Philippines. (coughs) I put these up there. I see no Western nations cited in these statistics, which I think is a very, very positive thing, especially as it was Western nations that sought to abolish slavery 
um, through those great reformers of the past. So I think that is just important for us to be aware of. That said, MB, the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment, reckon that there are around 3,000 individuals here in New Zealand who are living under modern day slavery. 3,000. Now that is a real sad indictment on certain members of the New Zealand community. But again, what I would say, and I have no statistics for this, but what I can tell you is from my own personal experience of having worked in this, it is more often than not nationals of the same country now domiciled in New Zealand who are the ones inflicting slavery on their fellows. The Vietnamese treat the Vietnamese badly. The Chinese treat the Chinese badly. The Filipinos treat the Filipinos badly. That's what I have seen. So it seems to be the fellow countrymen. It's very rare that I have come across a European New Zealander who is living in conditions of modern day slavery. It's very rare. Why is that? Probably because they won't put up with it and because they're citizens of this country. Whereas the people that come into this country who are not citizens here can be abused by people here. And for the vast, vast majority of what I have seen, and I have dealt with numerous cases over the years, it is fellow countrymen of origin um, ab abusing and exploiting fellow countrymen of the same origin. And very rarely is that European. Very, very rarely. So, <clears throat> I just wanted to put that out. When Paul's talking about slavery, this type of slavery is not modern slavery. It is not African-American slavery. That is not what scripture is talking about. Anyone making claims like that, using this piece of text to support that, well, they're failing to allow the text to speak to its era. America, the United States of America, did not exist as a nation state when Paul was writing this type of comment. The African-American slave trade did not exist in the sense that Paul was referring to when he was writing this. Nor did modern day slavery exist when Paul was writing this. This is speaking into a culture and one of many cultures at the time where having a slave was part of the norm. Whether we like to hear it, whether we agree with it, is immaterial. The practice back then was normative. This is what happened. This was the way things were done back then. And so we need to understand the cultural context. We need to understand how these words of Paul would have then been so radical in their setting. Absolutely radical. And then see what the principles are that flow from this that then transcend time, space and culture. The language used here when it mentions slavery has got to be considered in its own historical context, its own historical setting, not in our setting today. It's exactly the same principle when we talk about women. Women were treated very, very differently back in the ancient Near East. And when looking to understand this, we've always got to look back at the historical setting that women were living in. And the same historical contextual approach has got to be taken when we look at words like slave or slavery in the Bible. So I'm going to draw the parallel with the women here, and this, because this is how women were viewed. In his work, um, Paul Hager, in Women in the Bible, drawn from Qumran and early rabbinic literature, Paul Hager notes this. Criticising ancient laws by judging them against modern criteria and language without considering the prevailing circumstances of the period may constitute a biased approach. There is no doubt that in the Middle East at the relevant period women were discriminated against and scholarly evidence for this is unnecessary. What we can, and I would argue should do, is to examine the differences between attitudes towards women in various cultures or in different segments of the same society in the relevant period and attempt to understand their foundations, that is, the differing underlying philosophies or mythologies. Criticising attitudes towards women that today seem discriminatory and immoral, using language that depicts the rules and customs of ancient peoples as darker than they were, and without considering the prevailing circumstances, seems to me to constitute overkill. 
So, the same historical contextual approach must be applied to how we approach slavery. Criticising ancient laws by judging them against modern criteria and language without considering the prevailing circumstances of the period may constitute a biased approach. And I can guarantee you it will lead to a very biased approach. It's the criticism by modern standards that I think we need to be aware of, which is why we need to understand the world that Paul is speaking into. We've got to understand that. Slavery in the ancient Near East was common practiced. It was common practiced amongst all of the nations. And the slave was not defined by their colour. They weren't defined by whether they were black or whether they were white, because there were black slaves and there were white slaves. And you know what? There was every single shade in between that were slaves. They were defined, a slave was defined by how they came to be in slavery not by the colour of their skin. Some of those options, and this is taken from slave and master in ancient Near Eastern law. War. Slaves were captured for war. Foreigners captured in war were booty, and they could be dealt with as the captor saw fit. Kidnapping. Involuntary enslavement. And this only ever applied to foreigners. Houseborn. Old Babylonian slave um, sales. It was occasionally noted that a slave is a houseborn. Vilid uh, bitim, the offspring of a slave and the slave master. So the slave master will get together with a slave and there would be a houseborn slave. So that's how they came into slavery. They could come into slavery through debt. If a debt fell due, the debtor was unable to pay the creditor, then the creditor could seize goods or members of the debtor's family in order to force him the pay that was outstanding. So somebody could come into slavery through debt. Famine. Children were often sold into slavery in exchange for food. So you traded kids. You got rid of a couple of your kids so that you could get some food to feed the rest of your family. Penalties. Slavery uh, arose from the operation of a contractual penalty clause. So I will do this for you. You will do this for me. If I do this for you and you don't do this for me, then you will give me your son, daughter, and they'll be my slave. Okay, we'll enter into that agreement. So this is how people came into slavery. It was not based upon the colour of your skin. Could have been any colour. Didn't matter. Didn't matter. So none of those things are great. None of those things are good. And we look at all those things and go, goodness me, isn't that terrible? But that's the way things were done back then. And that's the society that Paul was writing to and addressing. So you bear that in mind. Now, also bear in mind that Paul was a Jew. A Jew. And first up, in the Israelite setting, slavery wasn't something that could last forever because there was a get-out clause for slaves. Turning back to Hagar again, the rules uh, governing Israelite slaves do not permit perpetual slavery for well-defined and significant doctrinal reasons. Leviticus 25.42 states, and verse 55 re-emphasizes, that the Israelites are God's servants and must not be sold as perpetual slaves. Therefore, neither an Israelite woman nor her children with an Israelite man can remain perpetual slaves. This was like the seven-year release thing. You, know, you get out of your slavery after you've done seven years of time. So, and this, as I understand it, is quite a substantial contrast to the horrors of slavery that were inflicted upon African-American people under other rules and other eras. In the Roman setting, the might of the military expansion became a major source for acquiring slaves. And I'm not aware that they would release them in a jubilee period either. So we're not talking about African-Americans. We're talking an ancient Near East setting. Slavery, not ideal at the best of times, and certainly not the way that any nation today should operate, didn't just result, though, in physical manual labour. Slaves at the time that Paul was writing performed a host of domestic services, an absolute host of them. Some were employed in highly skilled jobs. Some were employed in, in really well-known professions. Some would be teachers, accountants, physicians were often slaves. So, and prior to the Roman conquest, the Greeks, well, they had slaves that were highly educated. And the understanding of what a slave was under Greek rule is even more complex because there are a variety of levels of slavery, which I won't go into. 
But depending on what category, category a slave was in, they could work as a domestic help at home, they might work in retail, they might work on the land, they might work as police officers, <laughs> go figure. They might work as street cleaners, they might be ushers at events. All these were slave jobs. Unskilled slaves, or those that had been condemned to slavery as a form of punishment, they were the ones that would often be put out into that hard physical manual labour, working on farms, working in mills, working down mines. So then, how should we best interpret this word slave when we see Paul referring to it? Well, certainly not in the modern day sense of an African-American slavery, or indeed global modern day slavery, that's for sure. So what can we liken it to that's going to enable us to draw principles forward to the 21st century? Well, having looked at this, having spent some time studying this, the best way for us to understand this when we're looking at slaves and masters, as Paul is writing, is think of it as employee, employer. That is the best way for you to look at this. In fact, when I was looking through various versions, the Passion Translation words it exactly like that. Colossians 3.22 in the Passion. Let every employee listen well and follow the instructions of their employer. Not just when their employers are watching and not in pretense, but faithful in all things. For we are to live our lives with pure hearts in constant awe and wonder of the Lord. Slaves and masters, employees, employers... When we put it into that type of context, it might help us to not only understand the meaning of the word in Paul's world, but it will also help us to draw principles that we can perhaps consider today. So I've laboured that point because I don't want you to misunderstand the word slave in the context that Paul is writing and to narrow the scope that Paul is making. Because it would be too easy to sit here and say, well, that's OK. I don't have slaves, so this has got nothing to say to me. Uh, no. This has got a lot to say to you, because if you are an employee or an employer or you have ever been an employee or you have ever been an employer, guess what? It's relevant. The whole of scripture has lessons to be learned. It has lessons to be mulled over. And if you take the time to understand how it's been written and who it has been written to, we will be able to tease out what we can best learn from it. So Paul goes on with this verse, doesn't he? He says, obey your earthly masters in everything you do. And we've really come across that command to obey when we looked at the children in verse 20. That same Greek word, hupakeo, listen, obey. First up, before any, you step into any form of obedience, pin your ears back. Listen, listen, listen to what's being said. Obedience starts with a willingness to actually listen. It, it does, trust me, because you can sit there with your arms crossed. Um, this is not, not looking at anybody, but it's got their arms crossed. You can sit there with your arms. <laughs> you can sit there with your arms crossed, and you're going, no, I'm not doing that, I'm not doing that. You're not even listening. You know, you have to. You have to have a readiness to listen. You have to be willing to be teachable to learn. So, having paid attention to what's required, the expectation is that the slave would then get on and go on and do the thing that they need to do to the best of their ability. Think about it in, in a job situation. You're employed to do a job, okay? Your boss briefs you about how that job needs to be sorted out. So what you do first up is you listen carefully to what the boss is telling you to do. And then what you do is you go off and you do that job to the very best of your ability. And that's all carried out and completed in line with the requirements that you had listened to at the very beginning. You've listened to it and now what you've done, you've paid attention to it and you've followed those requirements and you are such a great employee. Such a great employee. And Paul encourages them to do that all the time, all the time. Not only when eyes are on them, but when eyes are not on them. No showing of hands here. But how many of you have really been engaged in your work with that sort of level of integrity underpin, underpinning everything that you have done? Well done, Gillian. Never slacking off, never sneaking a few minutes extra time here or there, never working a little bit slower, 
or even less productively when the boss is away. Yeah, well, when the cat's away, mice will play, won't they? Won't they? The saying is very true. They play less in a house, our house now, that we've got a couple of cats out there. But um, cats, 15, I think, mice, nil. Um, anyway, but Paul encourages these slaves to be diligent out of reverent fear for the Lord. Reverent fear for the Lord. Haplotase, it means presenting a singleness, simplicity, sincerity, mental honesty. Manifesting a virtue, free from pretense and hypocrisy. A person who's not self-seeking, but has an openness of heart, which manifests generosity. Paul says, be like that. Be like that in your work. Open, generous, and do it all out of awe and reverence for the Lord that you claim to represent. As an employee. And Paul carries on in verse 23, drills it down, drill the point, work willingly, work willingly. The word work is pretty standard translation for for what you would expect work to be. Work willingly. Made me smile as I was um, digging around with this. The the great Russian writer Fyodor Dostoevsky, um, who some of you may be aware of, he wrote this. Deprived of meaningful work, men and women lose their reason for existence. And they go stark, raving mad. So as a man who has now been technically out of work for the past nine months, I wondered if, I wondered if this was the time that I now pop, pop pencils up my nose and go, oh, wibble, oh, wibble, oh, wibble. Um, thank goodness that I've got the work to do serving you guys week after week. Otherwise, who knows what you could end up with on a Sunday. I know it's a bit of a lottery anyway, but uh, who knows. But that word work willingly, willingly. There may be uh, other versions that render it differently. It might read heartily, enthusiasm, enthusiastically, wholeheartedly, or from the heart. It's actually a Greek word, suke. It comes from breath, breath, the breath of life, the vital force which animates from the body, shows itself in breathing. It's used for the soul, the suke. Recognise the seat of our feelings, desires, affections or aversions, our heart and our soul. Our heart and our soul. Work willingly. Work with your heart and your soul. You've all heard the term, haven't you? Directed at you or maybe at others. Oh, they put all of their heart and soul into that. They put all of their heart and soul into that. Oh, you know, over here when we see the, the All Blacks face great opponents in rugby and it's real gruelling opposition that they're up against, maybe the South Africans or something like that. You know, really gruelling um, opposition. And we might at the end, end of the game go, man, those guys, they put their heart and soul into that game, didn't they? This is that, this is that sense that work willingly comes from. You put your heart and your soul into it. You give it your all. You don't hold anything back. There is no ounce of energy that wasn't pushed into achieving that goal. Employees work like that. Paul says, whatever you do for people, whatever you do for people, do it like that. Hold nothing back. Give it your all. Give it your heart. Give it your soul. And as a slave, as an employee, that's exactly the way that you need to conduct yourself in your work. Not because they, your employers, deserve it, because it's got nothing to do with them. You live like this. Whatever you do, you do it as if you were doing it for the Lord. Remember the Lord is that Greek word krios. It means the one to whom a person belongs because it is the Lord that owns you. He won you. He purchased you at such a great price that when you turn your hands to work, you do so with him in your mind. So you do your work as if you were doing it for him. You owe it to him to do your very best. After all, he gave his all to win you. And this is the very least that you can do. John Wesley wrote, one of the principal rules of religion is to lose no occasion of serving God. And since he is invisible to our eyes, we are to serve him in our neighbour, which he receives as if done to himself in person, standing visibly before us. Do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as you can. 
Great words from Wesley. And that would include in your day-to-day work, whatever that is, wherever that is, whoever your employer is. Challenge, eh? Tell me that this verse is not relevant to us today. Well, we don't have slaves. It's not relevant to me. I can sit back. Yeah, get over yourself. Paul then goes on to remind the church that the inheritance will be the reward. What inheritance? What inheritance did he mean? I don't necessarily think that what Paul is talking about here is crowns or trinkets or riches. I don't think that's in view. The Greek word inheritance is uh, kleronomia, kleronomia, and it's translated here as inheritance. This, this, this word was in common Christian usage for the possession of transcendent salvation. So the possession of transcendent salvation was the inheritance of God's children. <clears throat> So there was a well-known concept that this inheritance that Paul's talking about was eternal life. That was eternal life, which is then conveyed and demonstrated in the here and now. You see, we have eternal life now. We have eternal life now. Death doesn't stop that. Death doesn't stop that at all, which I think is a real hopeful view to hold on to, particularly as we all die. We have eternal life now. We are in eternal life now. (coughs) And if we hold, and if we were to understand and hold that view regarding eternal life, then what it may do is it may then make a difference to how we then live our temporal life here today. John Ortberg, in his work Eternity is Now in Session, writes this. In the New Testament, the terms salvation and eternal life and kingdom of God all speak to this same life-altering reality that we grasp by becoming disciples of Jesus. Salvation isn't about getting you into heaven. It's about getting heaven into you. It's not about what God wants to do to you. It's about what God wants to do in you. So what does God want to do in us? Well, he wants us to live a life that is honouring to the one that we claim to serve, recognising that he is our master, our curious, and recognise that all that we do is for our master, our curious, our Lord. Everything that we do. Remember that the master we are serving is Jesus the Christ. Jesus, the anointed one. The old Scottish preacher Alexander McLaren notes... If you want to live in this world doing the duty of life, knowing the blessings of it, doing your work heartily and yet not absorbed by it, remember that the one power whereby you can so act is that all shall be consecrated to Christ and done for his sake. Everything that you do, the duty of life, doing your work, being absorbed by your work, all consecrated to Christ, all done for his sake. And then Paul goes on to give a warning. If you do things wrong, you must be willing to accept the consequences of your actions. If you are not willing to accept consequences of your actions, don't do wrong. And if you do wrong and get caught for doing wrong, don't moan about it when you do get caught. Because you've made the choice. So don't complain about it. Don't moan about it. Preferably, don't do things wrong. But if you choose to do so, certainly don't moan when you get captured. That's just the way it works. That's just the way it works. Paul isn't pulling his punches here. We serve a gracious God, but God is also just. And while we can come back to him in repentance, what he may not do is he may not allow us to duck the physical, emotional or mental consequences of our choices. There's no guarantee. No guarantee. This is the ABC of life. Actions bring consequences. Actions bring consequences. And depending on the nature of those actions will depend on the type of consequences that could come boomeranging back at you. It's also worth noting that while we can all view ourselves as God's favourite, which is lovely, he doesn't show favouritism in his dealings. Favouritism is a Greek word, 
prosopolempsia, which includes partiality, but it's been rendered here favourites. It was a word used to describe unjust or unrighteous favouritism. God doesn't do that. Romans 2.11, Ephesians 6.9, James 2.1. When it comes to discipline of sins committed by those of the family of God, God will treat everybody equally. He has no favourites when it comes to dealing with sin. There is no partiality. None. So, choose wisely. Best not to choose doing wrong. If you do choose doing wrong, A, B, C. Your actions will bring consequences. So we're going to close off this, linking slaves to employees for our contextual understanding. So masters, then, if slaves equals employees, masters would be employers. Masters, they need to be just. This is the Greek word uh, dikaiaso, which, which when used in a judicial sense, um, means rendering to each his due. So give people what they're due. Don't forbid shortchange people as an employer. Give them what they're due. Give them their worth. You know, a workman is worth their wage. Give them what they are due. Um, it also means passing judgment on others, whether that's expressed in words or shown by a manner of conduct in dealing with them. So you need to treat people right. You need to treat people with the right attitude. You need to treat people with the, with the right reward system in place as an employer. It needs to be just and it needs to be fair. Esotase, which means it needs to be equal. Don't just go, well, I'm going to pay Robin that because I really like Robin. And Dave, I really don't like, so I'm going to pay him less because I'm, you know, they're doing the same job, but I prefer Robin. I mean, we all prefer Robin, right? <laughs> Apart from perhaps Jenny, who's married to Dave. But, you know, you, you know, you know what I'm saying? You've got to have an equal playing field. There needs to be equality. There needs to be fair. It needs to be equitable. There needs to be equality and balance in all of the judgments that are levied at an employee. And why is that? Because, well, we have to remember that we too, as an employer, have a kurios, a lord, a master who is in heaven. Now, heaven, let's just deal with that very swiftly. Greek word oranus it means the seat of things eternal, um, the consummately perfect, the place where God dwells with other heavenly beings. It's not a static place. It is a realm. It's a realm. Okay? The realm. Not just a, not like Buckingham Palace is in London and that's where the king lives. That's not like, you couldn't call that heaven. It is the whole realm of the, of the heavens. And God infuses everything. So you can't pin God down to heaven. Okay? And as humans, none of us hold that highest position or stand at that highest point, do we? It doesn't matter if you're king. It doesn't matter if you're president. There is a power that always sits above you. And there is always going to be a power that ultimately you will answer to. So I guess the message here is never get so far up yourself that you can't see the sun shining, whether you are prince or whether you are pauper, because you will all answer to a higher power. Everybody answers to a higher power. Following the end of the Second World War, uh, there were those in Nazi German regime who were brought to trial at that well-known event, Nuremberg Trials. We've all heard of the Nuremberg Trials. This was not a simple trial. This was not simple. This was not cut and dry series of trials. Because the defence argued that the Nazi perpetrators of crime were under the law. And under the law, they were innocent because they had been obeying the law and the legal requirements that had been set by the Fuhrer. So, in law, they were innocent. Courts are all about law. I don't think there's anyone in their right minds that, well, that would think that these people weren't guilty of heinous evil acts against humanity. I don't think anybody in their right minds would think that they weren't. But guess what? Evil isn't a legal category. Evil is not a legal category. I can remember years ago being at Crown Court and I had a very interesting case that I'd been investigating and I put before the judge and, the, and a jury 
And it was incredibly bonkers, this case, with the incestuous relationships of people. And this person was sleeping with this person while they were sleeping with that person and they were sleeping with that person. And the whole thing became such an intertwined mess that trying to pull out the offences in it was a nightmare. You could see the jury who were horrified at all of this stuff going on with these people. And the judge, before summing up, he looks at the jury and he says, ladies and gentlemen, we've had an interesting case. You know, it's, it was... Think of some soap opera on acid. You know, it was, it was horrendous. And he said, but what you need to remember is this is not a court of morals, this is a court of law. And you are to judge these people against the law, not whether you agree with their personal taste, proclivities. This is not a court of morals. The Nuremberg trial was not a court of morals. It's a court of law. And the defence in law, so... Evil isn't a legal category. So to establish culpability for crime, it needed to be established that an actual crime had been committed. So the chief counsel for the United States, a guy called Robert H. Jackson, he introduced an argument that ultimately won the day and was then upheld by the court as the basis for the vast majority of convictions against Nazi leaders. And his argument was this. There is a law above the law. There is a law above the law, and it's using this measure that one can then determine and make a judgment on which laws can be assessed as good and which laws can be assessed as evil, because there is a law above the law. Mm. Martin Luther King used the same sort of argument when he was locked up in Birmingham, Alabama. So what interests me is that in post-Christian society, how future atrocities, when they occur, which they will, how a court will then utilise such an agreed ideal? Because we're now post-Christian. What is the law above the law? Who sets that if there is no sovereign being, no God? Time will tell. So if that concept of thinking is kept in mind as an employer, that there is a law above you, always, not only, but mostly, what it will do is it will keep people humble. It will keep people humble, it will keep people grounded. And this is how employers should act. Remembering that ultimately they work for a God in heaven who they also are accountable to. So, all up, we are to turn all areas of our life over to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Whether as wives, husband, children, Parents, employees, employers, we come under him and we stand on what he represents. And in doing so, what we will do is we will live out that golden rule that Jesus taught. Matthew 7, 22, do to others whatever you would like them to do to you. This is the essence of all that is taught in the law and the prophets. Do not mistake that with what some people mistake, with the SAS motto of do unto others before they do unto you. Okay, so don't do that. Don't do unto others before they do unto you. Do to others whatever you would like them to do to you. And that standard then of Christ's, that golden rule of Christ's, ought to be the standard that then flows out of us and reflects him in our societies and our communities. Be the difference, church. Be the difference. Because this is what you are called to do. And if not you, who? Who? Wear him well. Wear him well. Bless you. Let's just pray. Lord, again, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the beauty of your word, the relevance of your word, thousands of years old, yet still completely relevant to human society today. Whether we are wives, husbands, children, parents, employees, employers, you cover the gambit, Lord. And you know what? It's all about you, how we live our life, how we reflect you, how we wear you. And I pray, dear Lord, that each one of us would wear you well that people as they look at us would go, yeah, those guys, they show something different and I like what I see. So Lord, we thank you for who you are. May we honour you in our work. May we honour you in our employment, whatever that might be. May we honour you in our familial relationships. You deserve all the glory.
You deserve all the honour. You deserve all the praise. And in your name we pray. Amen.